Let's go. Let's go. Ja, können. Ben je al ingelogd? Oké. Okay. Ja. Yeah. Okay, Erica, I think it's 11, so if we... Wonderful, welcome to all. Um, I imagine we'll have some other people joining us soon, uh, but we've scheduled an hour, so I think we'll, we'll kick off. I just have a few remarks to, to introduce the Necessary Conversations talk today. Um, I did put a message in the chat. Uh, if you have questions as we go through the conversation and the presentations, Please add these to the chat. Uh, we'll have enough people on that I think we'll need to moderate uh, the Q&A through the chat box. Um, 
just uh, uh, reminders to please mute your microphone if it's not already. And then also uh, for your questions, if they're clarifying questions, wonderful, we'll, we'll tackle those first. Um, and then we're really hoping we can get to a, a rich conversation uh, that really focuses more on co-constructing and refining a theory of community. Um, so again, welcome to all. Uh, this is Necessary Conversations, typically research forum, but it also spans practice and pedagogy as well. Um, welcome. I know I, many are familiar faces and names, so welcome back. And for those of you who are new, I hope you'll join us again. Uh, we hold these conversations every one to two months uh, on a regular basis, and we'll continue inviting you now that you're here. Um, just a little bit of background. We started Necessary Conversations as a platform to have these types of dialogues, to move these types of ideas forward in ways that uh, several of us weren't finding uh, through other more conventional um, either organizations or groups we were a part of. Um, this is an initiative of the International Humanistic Management Association, which is a group that's been uh, working up to this moment for almost the past decade, but more formally in the past couple of years. Um, Michael Pearson, who will be on the call with David today, is a founder of, um, of that group, and so he'll be able to say a bit more about that. Um, but uh, really in the service of getting to the conversation, I know that's why you're all here, um, I'd like to introduce David Corton, um, who is a thought leader and activist. Many of you may recognize David just from uh, your worlds and your interest in the topics he addresses. Um, he's written a book uh, that you may be aware of when corporations rule the world. Um, he's an, an activist in the space that I admire. It's intersected by living economies, sustainable futures, and systems transformation. And so we'll hear more about that in terms of moving from a theory of the firm to a theory of community today. Um, David's a former HBS faculty member. Um, and again, I really admire David, you, welcome, uh, for really tackling this tension between prospering and perishing. I think it's an important, um, important question we should all be asking. Um, so without further ado, I think I'm going to turn the conversation over to David and to Michael. We'll start with Michael, um, who will be sharing some foundational ideas and then moving on to David for conversation and eventually with all of you co-constructing theory of community that we've been excited to, to be thinking about. So welcome, <laughs> Michael, David, welcome. Thank you, Erica. And thank you, David, and thank you all for being here. So my name is Michael Pearson, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give a short overview um, of uh, the theory of the firm, and I will not do it justice, uh, but others on the call can possibly then uh, fill in on what we think is potentially relevant for a conversation of another type of theory. But just to give a quick background, of course, the theory of the firm emerged from the question that why can't markets do everything? Why are there firms? And various strands of theories have sort of been used to answer that question. And uh, principal agency is one of those uh, um, transaction cost theory, property rights theories. They all sort of were mingled to a degree uh, in a way to explain why there are firms and then also how to explain or answer, ask the, answer the question, how should we manage firms? And one of the things that came out of that in the 70s was that, yes, you need to have a single objective of the firm, and that should be shareholder value maximization because shareholders are the ones that aren't represented. And in a way, so to protect them, that should be uh, the, uh, the duty uh, of management and owners, and you need to align interests and shareholder value maximization and options can somehow do this. So this is what we are witnessing, of course, as the traditional kind of setup of corporations. And as David had pointed out in the 90s and others also, this is a setup that doesn't necessarily help with other kinds of problems. And the setup uh, that we're currently facing I'm sorry, I'm trying to mute people if there's background. Um, that we're currently facing, of course, questions the setup of all kinds of organizations, and we need to figure out what kind of theories can guide us in that. And, and David will go into that, but I think uh, clearly the theory of the firm has maybe its place. It is not the only theory and cannot be the only theory in guiding us forward in terms of understanding organizing and organizations. 
And so what alternatives are there? Uh, Jim Walsh, who may be on the call, uh, has proposed the theory of business to answer the current questions better. Uh, in what way can business be a contributor to the current or the solution of the current crisis that we're facing as a species? Others have proposed uh, alternative uh, theories of the firm. J.C. Spender is on the call who has done work on that a lot and others as well. And, and theories of communities have been uh, developed to some degrees. And I think uh, when David and I were talking, we were sort of was pointing out, you know what, your work about living economies and communities uh, may lend itself to sort of uh, help us guide a tour, us towards a different kind of theory that understands a organization as a community or that just learns from principles of living communities and then applies that to ways we can organize better. So I leave it at that for now, just to give you a background and then uh, turn over to David because he has sent um, many of you already some kind of basic thoughts, premises uh, for what he considers could be useful. And so we'll start with David uh, explaining his current thinking on this notion. And then I think we can help uh, all together to sort of co-construct what we think on a hope or expect from a, a, an alternative theory uh, in that context. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, David, for taking this on. And I'll just turn over to you now. Michael and Erica, um, as this has developed, I must say I've gotten very excited about uh, what we're doing this morning. Um, just a little bit of background. Uh, I think it's useful to understand my path to understand uh, the, the framing that I'm going to share with you. Um, my field of management study at Stanford and then teaching at Harvard at the business school was business organization. So that's the, uh, that's the sort of piece of, of business. Um, but as I think you're all aware, when we teach in a business school, we look out, we view the world through the lens of the firm. Now, what happened in my career is I got out of academia and spent uh, much of my professional life, living and working in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, I came to look back at the firm through the lens of society, the lens of global society. And that fundamentally flips the frame of reference. Also, by the experience of living and working uh, in relation to some of the world's more exotic cultures, at least from our standpoint, uh, I became very conscious of how a people's collective narrative uh, shape their collective behavior. So I came to understand culture in a much deeper way, uh, also understanding what it tells us about our human nature and our human possibilities because you become aware of how differently people can think and organize uh, depending on what their cultural story is. Um, and that is terribly significant in terms of understanding the nature of our current time. Um, so over time, as I was working on the problems of what we called underdevelopment, uh, I also became aware, I, you know, I was living and working overseas for, uh, we lived overseas for 21 years, so this was not a, not a brief part of my life. But over that period, we came to see how the processes of what we called economic development, as was framed by the neoliberal economic theories, was actually destroying cultures, destroying communities, families, and the natural systems on which we all ultimately depend. Uh, and that is what set me on the, the, the search for what are the alternatives. And it was that recognition that led uh, my wife, Fran, and I to come back home to the United States uh, to share what we'd learned abroad about the ultimately terrifying consequences of some of our favored economic theories. Um, now, the thing that's very interesting about uh, this particular session is that I have never posed what I've been working on before as a theory. Uh, it's always seemed very coherent to me, but it, it didn't use that theory frame. 
And it was out of the discussion with Michael where he brought up the theory of the firm. And then that triggered a memory about this idea that if you have a bad theory uh, that's driving society, just critiquing the theory is not enough. It has to be replaced by an alternative theory. And so as we talked about that, it came to mind, well, what would be the alternative to the firm? Perhaps it would be a theory of community. Now, I stress this beginning process because I want you to know the paper I sent you is, you know, is something that I, you know, I just wrote in the past couple of weeks. And uh, this is the first conversation I've had with any group posing this in terms of a theory of community. And we do it with the hope that this will intrigue all of you and the development of that theory can be something of a, uh, of a collective process, which is in fact the only way that it can really move forward uh, if we're gonna change in a sense the, uh, the theory around which we teach business and economics and around which we organize as a society. Um, so this is basically an invitation. Now, at the heart of it, it's an organizational choice. It's a fundamental choice about how we organize as a society. And at the very simplest level, um, the choice is whether we organize as a global society around corporations that are designed to make money, to maximize making money, or organized around communities to make a living. Now, it's a really simple, basic choice. And when we say organize around communities to make a living, uh, I don't mean a salary. <laughs> I mean a living in the deepest sense uh, in all the aspects of, of what living involves. Uh, so, if we're organizing around the theory of the firm and money, then we're assuming that money is wealth and the measure of value. Um, the assumption that society is just a collection of uh, utility maximizing individuals. And as I think many of you are aware, that assumes that the ideal, well, that the human nature and the human ideal uh, very much resembles the uh, behavior of the psychopath, uh, which is a pretty bad assumption. Um, and I don't know about you, but most of my friends are not psychopaths. <laughs> and most of the people I know and enjoy and associate with are not psychopaths. Um, the psychopaths are, do exist, but they are a minority. And to organize society around their behavior is uh, more than a little weird. Now, in terms of organizing around communities to make a living and the idea of a theory of community, um, you know, I did a little Googling after Michael and I had this uh, discussion. And I, uh, you know, there are a few references to a theory of community, but it clearly is not developed in any coherent way and has no particular standing. Um, and yet our challenge as a human species is to create a, a, an organizational framework uh, in which we learn to behave like mature, socially conscious adults, recognizing that that is our, our, our nature uh, and it is our ideal. Um, and that, of course, then also depends on creating organizations, both educational inst institutions that, tr that, develop, that are training, our education uh, develops those qualities of maturity. And the organizations support the patterns of mature interaction and reward mature behavior. Uh, so let's... Uh, I'm trying to keep the actual presentation very short so we have maximum time for the discussion. And Erica, if you'd put up the first slide. Yes, I'll, I'll do that right now. Okay, this, is, this slide represents what I've uh, drafted as a foundational premise of a theory of community. Um, 
and it's as I by it fits with my understanding of uh, our our current understanding of uh, of of the leading edge of the life sciences, but it also is uh, <laughs> is pretty obvious in terms of uh, it, it doesn't take a PhD to to grasp this concept. Um, that life exists only in multi-species communities that self-organize to create and maintain the conditions essential to their own existence. We humans are living beings, and therefore we exist only as members of multi-species, a, a multi-species living community. Now, it's very uh, important that we actually apply this fundamental premise to our understanding of, of Earth and recognizing that the traditional, the, the, the traditional indigenous concept of Earth as a, a living being, a living Earth, the living mother, is actually in many ways quite literal. Um, and it fits with our growing scientific understanding. Uh, the way I kind of put this in context is, you know, the scientists now estimate that there are uh, as many as two trillion galaxies in the cosmos, which is quite a few galaxies. You can imagine the number of planets that are involved, and we certainly haven't discovered all of them, but of all the planets that we've yet identified, Earth is the only one that has the conditions on its surface essential to support the kinds of life we know and human life. And that seems to me really significant. And the, the part of what makes this planet distinctive is that it is inhabited, uh, that it, all the species that actually self-organize working with the deeper systems of Earth uh, the only way I know that we can account for why do we have these different surface conditions on Earth. Um, so that makes the community uh, truly significant. We're not just talking about communities and individual organizations. We're talking about living communities, starting with Earth as a living community and then all our subcommunities. So now, um, as I begin playing around with those, uh, uh, the starting point beyond that was to identify uh, three foundational organizing principles. Um, and I, I've been following the frame of holarchy rather than hierarchy, uh, but I was just reminded there are other ways to go about this. Uh, but let's uh, throw, up, uh, throw up the three principles, the next slide. Okay, so these are just the three three principles. Number one, life must be the defining value. And the community must be the defining unit of organization. Uh, principle two, communities self-govern or self-organize as radically self-organizing holarchies, applying the principles of subsidiarity, the organizing principles of subsidiarity. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, principle, it means that essentially the higher, the higher order levels of, of organization uh, must be designed to support lower levels in controlling and self-organizing their, um, their own resources, which is a, a very major shift from command and control. Uh, then principle three, each community, and so we're now talking about sub-communities, local communities uh, across our surface, each community must strive for local material self-reliance and providing a full, happy, uh, healthy, happy life for all its members. Um, so this is the concept of economic localization that you may be familiar with that many of us have been advocating. Now I want to go quickly through each of these principles and some of the implications. So principle one, again, life must be the defining value and the community must be the defining unit of organization. So a number of things follow from this. Uh, corporations must serve the community. Um, and therefore, each community 
or each corporation must have a public purpose and be subordinate to the community that created it, uh, which is very uh, consistent with the uh, original view of the corporation in the founding of the United States. Um, that corporations existed only for a limited period of time, and they uh, each they were they were chartered only to fulfill a public purpose and held accountable for that. Uh, I believe it would follow from this frame that the corporation has no rights beyond the jurisdiction of that community that created it. Ownership must be long-term and structured to secure the accountability of the firm to members of the community. And that there's no place for speculation on the price and exchange of shares. So that would be a rather uh, significant shift from the way we go about it now. Um, so let's go to principle two. Um, communities must self-govern as radically self-organizing holarchies applying the organizing principles of subsidiarity. Um, so the, uh, um, this leads you to a frame of essentially nested bioregions, uh, starting from the local bioregion and, and moving upward, which is, is basically, as you begin to understand uh, how ecosystems work and earth as an ecological system, uh, that is essentially the way it organizes. Um, we had an interesting email from Shan uh, Turnbull uh, this morning. I don't know if she's in the audience. Uh, she's in, uh, in, uh, um, in, in, in Australia. Uh, she began, she was bringing, she's, she's working around the ideas of Arthur Kostler. Um, and it actually ties up with uh, the frames of Eleanor Ostrom that I work with. Uh, but trying to understand the, the complexities of these systems that organize as life organizes. So that then gets you into another of sub subsidiary uh, ideas. Uh, the communities uh, must be defined and organized as territorially defined bioregions. Um, you know, essentially, if you're going to organize a living community, uh, you have to organize as a living community, um, and you have to define it territorially, which is the is the way that uh, that biosystems organize. Uh, the governance must be highly participatory. There's there's no at least I, I haven't found anything that seems to resemble a, uh, a hierarchy in a living system uh, in the conventional command and control sense. Um, the, the governance in our systems that try to emulate that must be highly participatory, far beyond current structures of representative democracy, uh, which are, in many ways, if you understand it, mostly command and control relics inherited from empire. You take the structure of empire and then you add some elected officials at the top of the hierarchy. And as we're now seeing, that uh, doesn't always work terribly well. Um, now, within Holonic national structures, higher level governance institutions uh, protect and support the lower level communities in their control and adaptive management of their resources all to meet the material needs of their community in ways that are hopefully spiritually fulfilling. Uh, so it's not just matter, not just staying alive, but that's part of living. Uh, and the relationships uh, mostly need to be uh, mediated by non-monetary exchange, but uh, as humans, monetary exchange may well be a, uh, a part of that. So let's move to uh, principle three. Um, this basically is the principle of self-reliance, um, uh, striving for local self-reliance and providing full and happy life for all the community's members. So here we see, we come to the need to meet energy needs primarily with local capture of solar and wind energy, um, maximize the transfer of material resources, both within and between communities, 
uh, maximize the free exchange of knowledge, information, technology, and culture within and between communities, uh, and organize all material processes around continuous circular flows. Uh, now, this idea of exchange is, is interesting. It, um, this actually conforms to uh, the way the early economists uh, uh, thought about uh, thought about trade. Uh, that you you meet most of your needs locally, and you uh, you trade at the margin rather than the kind of situation we have now, where we're essentially uh, trading. Uh, yeah, the ideal seems to be is the further away you you get your food and your inputs, the uh, the better for the global economy, which is only good for the corporations that control those flows. Uh, so again, we, we end up here with the, the challenge. Uh, the, the theory of the firm, once you lay it out, is, uh, is so badly flawed uh, that it's really almost embarrassing that as a species we have ever given it any credibility. And yet to um, move beyond it, we have to develop and popularize the theory of the community. Uh, that has powerful implications for economic policy, for how we organize and manage our organizations, and how we uh, we train the, the students who will be the leaders of the future of these organizations, and who in fact have to be the leaders of the process of um, the very incredible institutional transformation we have to navigate if we are going to have a common future. So I want to turn it back to you, Erica, now, and uh, we can do questions of clarification and then go on and figure out whether anybody's interested in next steps. Great. Um, thank you, David. So I couldn't see my screen or the chat box because the slides were up. So I'm just <laughs> quickly reviewing the, the chat right now. Um, I noticed that a lot of comments went up around principle two. Um, let's see. Um, there was a, a comment by, I, I'm not sure that your, your handle is bunch one J that a true theory of the firm needs to also apply to all forms of organization, including partnerships, co-ops, forms other than C corps. Um, I'm not sure if you had more to add to that comment bunch one J, uh, in terms of how that might relate to a theory of community, but you're welcome to unmute and if you'd like to share your comment or question. Unmute is on the bottom left. I'm here. Great, hi. Hi, how are you? Good. One of the things that I've noticed as we talk about the theory of the firm historically is that it typically the conversation has always focused on agency theory problems, separation of management from ownership, and um, and implicitly focused on C corporate structures that we have in place, uh, and that's where shareholder primacy comes into play. Uh, and I've always thought that that was a flawed kind of basis for a conversation about the purpose of business, because the purpose of business obviously has to incorporate uh, a much wider understanding of uh, economic organizations that are active and exist in the world today. Um, and I think the community approach as a foundational assumption is a great basis from which to start that alternative conversation. So I don't think it's inconsistent, but I think it it really could lead to um, a more basic understanding of what we're doing and what we're about. So uh, I think as a corollary, one of the biggest challenges that we face in schools of business is this paradigm approach to what we teach that is anchored in the idea that the only kind of uh, organizing structure that uh, informs our scholarship is C corporations and shareholder value. So that's where I'm coming from. I totally agree with you. Yeah. So. Uh, can you just say your name 
because the uh, handle, I think if everybody John, just mm -hmm. it's John Bunch, B U N C H. Thanks, John. Yeah. Um, great. I also see some additional questions or comments. Uh, Perez One LA says corporate governance principles, for instance, seek to mitigate the negatives of self interest, uh, those identified by agency theory, but there's not much in terms of positive recipes. Um, so I, please, if you'd like to unmute Perez One LA, if you'd like to comment further, you'd also had another comment earlier. On mute is bottom left, if you're still on. I might chime in there. This is John Bunch again. Uh, when we look at the history of microfinance and how the original microfinance structures, uh, organizing principles were framed, their approach to uh, counterbalancing self-interest was completely embedded in community where they had the investing circles uh, in community that had some say or oversight over the actions of the entities that they were investing in. And I really agree with, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read into David's idea that, <laughs> that um, we, we can use community as the solution to self-interest issues. Uh, if, if I may, sorry, it's because my computer, uh, I don't have a camera, so, but I'm here with John, I'm Perez, Juan L.A., Luis oh. Perez, and just my point was that there is nothing really positive, and this community theory can probably extend that situation in the sense of, well, what is that we're achieving, or how is that we're touching in order to get positive results, not only mitigate the shortcomings of humankind, let's say. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. You're welcome. We're obviously in the same institution. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, a twofer. Great, um, sorry, I'm just going back up through. I know there was a question of clarification by Dan Weltman. Dan, are you on? Um, sorry, what did that come in? Bottom left to unmute. Dan, if you're on. Yeah, I think I'm on. I can't hear you very well. I'm not sure if everyone else can. I can hear it. Okay, good. But what, what did I comment? Sorry, I, I have to look at my own comment now. Oh. <laughs> what did I say? Do you have his comment there? He doesn't remember what he said. Oh, sorry. It's my question was how to maintain the efficiency and productivity of capitalist firms in an alternative system. And the question is being asked, um, mindful of the fact that the capitalist system has huge externalities, such as global warming, warming. But it sounds like efficiency and productivity might be threatened under this alternative theory of community. It seems to be the concern. Or question. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, like how do you duplicate the uh, efficiencies of scale, for example, uh, that sort of thing. Because the, there was talk about maximizing profits, they also max, maximize productivity, uh, which means more goods and services for us. If you switch to an alternative system that is not focused on that, then you, it could mean practically a lower kind of living. Yeah, my, I mean, my response to that would be that. Um, those basic concepts of maximizing productivity, economies of scale, and so forth, are basically all framed around the the goal of making money, rather than the goal of living. Um, one of the principles of healthy living systems and their capacity to adapt to changing circumstances is that they are very localized. Uh, to their local conditions, and they have a great deal of redundancy. Um, and that's essential to their resilience. So we could say that the whole frame that leads us to be focused on efficiency and productivity often uh, 
in the end, also producing things that are not necessarily essential to our living or to the quality of our lives. Uh, it's, it's just the wrong focus. Okay. I'd like to add something to that too. Having worked in major corporations, there is no efficiency and effectiveness. It's all self-interest except with few exceptions. Um, so the waste is phenomenal. Uh, so I don't buy into capitalism as being efficient and effective and product productive. Okay. Um, there was a uh, Sternbull at MBA 1963. Welcome. I, I, it sounds like you have some comments. Of, I'm not sure which principle, principle that ownership should be long-term. Um, and, and maybe that's a question of both clarification and also some critique of how to move toward a theory of community, but please go ahead. Hello, my name is Shan Turnbull in Sydney, Australia at about 3.30 in the morning. And, uh, uh, and David mentioned about earlier, you, you, yes, law, all corporations had limited life. And if they have life longer than a patent, investors are getting overpaid in a way that accountants do not report. And it's how you get inequity and inefficiency. And so you need to have uh, creative destruction, have a use by date, not just for corporations, but any social organizations, an idea of community. And the other key thing is, I didn't mention in that, is that you don't have one central decision-making organ. There's multiple decision decision-making. And I agree with David, we are talking about holons and hierarchy. And one of the defining characteristics of holons and hierarchy that they have con contrary properties. And this occurs just like the, the architecture of the brain is organized. Different parts of the brain make different decisions. It's a way of um, uh, reducing information overload. And no business school in the world that I know of teaches how to make distributed decision making. So you have competing centers of decision making and power. And just like the human brain, different parts of the brain take over the, the control decisions depending upon the physiological and environmental context. So I think I've said enough. Excellent. That's a piece that I'd not been introduced to, but it absolutely fits and essential. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Kiliji or Kilji had asked a question about a foundational question: How is community being defined? Uh, do you have more to add to that question, Kilji? Are you? Can you hear me? Yes. Now I do. Okay. This is Shaisa Kilji, and um, thank you, David, for your. Um, thought-provoking principles. Um, so my question is really basic because I want to understand where you come from. Um, initially, you did um, um, talk about adopting a lens of global society because of your work in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Mm -hmm. uh, however, when you were describing, there's a lot of str straddling between local and the global. So my question is, uh, when you talk about theory of community, how are you defining community? Or are we just restricting ourselves by focusing upon the local and global because this is the framework within which we operate. So um, I think it would help a lot if we clarify what does community mean to us or what does it mean to you? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I'm thinking of it within the uh, framework of, of holarchy, if you're familiar with that. Um, and it's, you know, it's very complicated when you start putting it together. Uh, if, you, if you think about how life organizes, the basic decision-making is always extremely local. Um, but the biosystems are, are organized in whole archies, so we, we hardly have language even to uh, describe, uh, let alone to, you know, to talk about and, and understand, which is part of our challenge. Um, but the kind of community I'm concerned with is a, a living community, which means that it has to be attached to place, and it has to include not just humans, but it has to, it, it includes the natural systems of our place on which our own existence and health and well-being depend. Um, and it's a great question. It's a question that I hope that you 
might all be challenged to apply your minds to and help us figure out collectively how we answer that question. Great. And then Fabrizio, since I think this is a nice segue, asks about the Hellenic organization or holarchy um, and suggests that it may not work in every condition. So um, Fabrizio, would you like to raise your comment or question? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Thanks, Erika. Uh, my name is Fabrizio Maimone. I'm from Rome, Lunza University. Uh, my concern is about the, uh, how can I say, the universal value of the Olonic model. Because we know that this model was uh, conceived and uh, uh, maybe it works better in uh, the context of uh, project-based uh, uh, digital uh, uh, enterprises and so on. Meanwhile, uh, uh, this model, uh, how can I say, it, it is supposed to be less uh, suited for a traditional kind of organization. So my question is, uh, it is possible to conceive a community-based uh, economic system, even though we can use different kind of uh, organizational models. And if not, how can we try to adapt the Olonic model to different kind of business? Yeah, I'm not sure I totally follow, but I think it aligns with the other questions that have been raised, uh, the points that have been raised. Uh, which is all pushing us to recognize just how complicated uh, these systems are. It includes the frame that in the, the, the idea of the, in the brain, there are different parts of the brain making different kinds of decisions and somehow it all relates together. And maybe some of these are like project decisions, but the overall frame comes together <laughs> to make the community work. Um, and I'm, I'm most fascinated in a way by our, our own bodies and the organization of our bodies and the idea that each of us is comprised of tens of trillions of individual decision-making living cells. And somehow these trillions of cells all organize in a, a ultimately cooperative way that maintains, creates and maintains the crucible of our consciousness and agency. So just within each individual, we get into an organizational challenge that <coughs> absolutely defies our current understanding. It's far beyond anything that we've even contemplated as organizational theorists. And yet we all experience it every day <laughs> and every human being on earth uh, experiences it. In a, and in a way, every multi-organism uh, organism, a uh, uh, multi-celled organism in the world experiences it. So we got a lot of work to do to figure out <laughs> how you organize with this level of complexity. Our, our, our task in a way is absolutely simple compared to uh, what, what life does. Great. Um, so I know I'm just looking through again some of the chat comments and I am so far behind. Thank you all for this rich discussion in the chat box and just know if we don't get to all the questions or discussion, uh, there will certainly be avenues for future conversation, questions and dialogue on this topic um, and we won't lose the chat history here. So we can uh, respond that way as well. Um, Mike Barnett, I think you're on and you're asking, I, I assume it's Mike, uh, about resource disparities in various communities. So if resource sharing is minimized, how do communities that lack key resources prosper? I'm not sure if you'd like to pose that question or comment in a different way. Um, you want me to do it in like in a different voice or different sure, language? Any, you know, bring it. <laughs> I can do a dance. So. Sure. But no, no the, I, this comes from the slide. You mentioned minimizing resource exchanges across. Yeah. And, you know, obviously different communities have very different resource endowments. So I'm wondering how communities that basically have, they lack what they need, uh, would get what they need without it already being there. Yeah, well this, this would be a matter of one of exchanging things that we really need rather than somebody else can produce it cheaper. Um, but the bigger issue that we face here, uh, if you look back historically, of course, uh, 
you know, the way we maintain our, our very high consumption in the United States, high levels of consumption, and the way that's worked generally for, quote, developed nations, is by expropriating, colonizing the resources of less powerful countries. Um, so we have used that trade not to make up, make up, make up, make up kind of natural deficiencies. Uh, uh, wait, some, wait, some, somebody, somebody I, I'm getting, I'm, a, I'm getting a huge feedback, feedback uh, uh, which suggests which somebody, somebody microphone is not muted or something. Muted or something. Um, um, the way the way we need to work, we out, need this work out this balance. Balance. Wow. Um, um, sorry, I don't know if sorry, other people are hearing, hearing your feedback. feedback. I don't um, hear it, but if everyone mutes on the bottom left, and then David can respond. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the. Um, the um, you know, we're hugely out of balance in terms of uh, in terms of a species now. Uh, the exchanges we need to deal with have got to have, have got to deal with how we ad adjust for those adjustments or, or those those differences in endowment, uh, not how we maximize our individual profits or individual consumption. Um, my thought is that in the larger picture. Um, you know, there are countries like Bangladesh, uh, probably Haiti. Uh, and I assume people here could probably name others, uh, that there's no way that they can meet their basic needs uh, within the, the limits of their current resources. Um, those changes to work within a self-organizing, uh, locally self-reliant model would need to be dealt with, I think, best by population movements. Uh, so that we balance out population ultimately in relation to local endowments so that again each community can be focused on you know it's not just living within your own means but it is also managing your local lands your local waters uh your local energy supplies and so forth so that you keep things in balance um the the way the the way any healthy ecosystem has to function um, so that again, I, if you follow what I'm saying, it's, there's no simple answer to it, but, uh, I think ultimately it needs to, to be dealt with by, more by moving people around rather than, you know, uh, massive movements of physical resources. Great. So, um, we're talking now about really some massive structural challenges to this type of transformation. Atia Martin had brought up, uh, the challenge of cognitive bias at the more individual level and how might that play into the systems change? Atia, would you like to raise your comment? If you're still on. Atia Martin. Okay, so she may have left the call or he may have left the call. Nope, sorry uh, about that. Oh, hello. <laughs> I had to get back to myself to unmute myself. Hi. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. So really I was um, uh, looking at the real, the reality of how, how we actually operate as human beings and the challenges of um, how we've been conditioned um, in conjunction with, in conjunction with, um, or connection with how we um, uh, actually operate in this challenge of um, our group identities being um, more significant in the way we've been conditioned than who we are as individuals and the nuances and that what we are in terms of our group identities is not equivalent to who we are as individuals, but that is the way that our common discourse operates. And that's where we get a lot of inequities and stereotypes and ideologies about who people are, how they're supposed to be, and the limitations that places on our ability to truly connect with one another and see each other's real humanity across a difference, visible, obvious difference, um, as opposed to our, our um, connections we have that are much, far more vast as individuals um, across our humanity and the things that are important to us and what we want and our need in our lives um, and how 
is that accounted for in kind of these three philosophies and what are some ways that we can be more explicit about it because it is such a prevalent reality that we don't um, incorporate into how we approach organizing structures and bodies because we try to sanitize them um, and dehumanize them. So that's really the question as part of rehumanization, how does this fit into the framework? Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, again, very, uh, very good question and part of the uh, uh, par part of the complexity. I mean, part of it is the, the, the issues of what do we assume to be our human nature in terms of at least our, our collective choices, our collective actions. Um, I'm not sure whether you're uh, also intend to touch on the issue of identity politics. Um, one of the things I've become very conscious of in that regard is that um, an awful lot of our uh, politics currently in the United States is, is focused on uh, racial identities, uh, gender identities, and so forth. Uh, and who has been most exploited, who owes what to who, and so forth. Uh, which I've come to view as, uh, it, it, it's, it's interesting, it's, it's an awareness that we have to develop, uh, but it cannot be solved within the way it is framed there. Uh, that we're now, in a, we're now in a situation in which we, we have become, we are, whether we like it or recognize it or not, a truly uh, global species. And in a sense that we we ultimately all prosper, uh, and I think of prosperity as spiritual prosperity uh, with uh, material sufficiency. Uh, we figure out how to do that all together, or there may be no future for any of us. Uh, so while we need to build on and recognize the sins of the past, uh, the the challenge is not to sort them out individually. It has to be uh, to transform, create a system that actually works for everybody instead of the imperial system that uh, in which there are a few people on top, most people are on the bottom. And so then it's just a matter of determining what are the identity characteristics that define who's going to be on top and who's going to be on the bottom. But it, it, you know, it's the whole wrong way. <laughs> To frame the problem, um, we've got to get beyond that, or uh, we're we're in a sense we. I mean, quite literally, we may all be dead. Uh, great. I I know there are a couple more people who'd had some questions, many more actually, and uh, just based on our time, I'm not sure that we'll get through them all. But Sarah um, Menar, I think, had been on with a question, and then Manish had also had a question. Sarah, would you like to raise a question or a comment? Uh yeah, yeah hi. Can I please? Manish here. Hi, Manish. Can Sarah go first and then we'll come to your question? Okay. Thanks. Manish here. Okay. One thing which I was thinking that maybe which would work in this particular context if we look at if we look at how individuals view themselves, and I'm looking at the, the individualism to collectivism point of view and if we look at uh, what the Center for Creative Leadership does in terms of social identity theory, that we are probably simultaneously not only an individual but, uh, but we are also a part of communities. Right, and for and therefore, I could be a part of the family, which could be a part of a clan, which could be a part of something else, also, and all that. And therefore, would it be possible to think of this community more as an extension of oneself? And would that bring about a change in which in which we look at the firms as well? So that particular firm could well be a part of the industry, which may perhaps be contributing towards the society or the environment. That's what I'm looking at as to how individuals look at themselves, how individuals look at that particular part of the organization, which is a part of a larger setup. Could that be one yeah. way in which we could look at the picture of the firm? Thank you. Yeah, I'm not quite ready to go that far with the theory of the firm. I think we've got to get the community established first. Now, in terms of the individual, uh, your question brings to mind, uh, again, my understanding of the way the bo our, each of our individual human bodies organize. Uh, 
if you think of all those trillions of cells, each making decisions, and you look at how that works, it is as if each individual cell is making its decisions with both a recognition of the importance of its individual identity. Each cell has its function within the body, and these functions are different, and the body depends on them. At the same time, the cell exists only as a contributing member of the larger community or the larger collective. And so it makes its decisions as if it is aware of both its individuality and of its wholeness, its groupness. Um, and I, I think basically, I, I think it's, it's, it's true and it's interesting, uh, the experience of having spent many years in Asia, uh, where particularly uh, strong, there, you know, the recognition of the community which is basically an indigenous concept also uh, that sometimes goes so far that in a sense, the only existence is the community or the organization, uh, not the individual. Um, and I, I kind of think of this as you know, a historic transition to where we come to recognize both the significance of our individual identity and agency, but also that that must be understood within the context of the community and the whole and well-being of the body. Um, and that's also critical to, uh, to, to the processes of, uh, of resilience and the processes of creativity by which, uh, which life continues to evolve toward ever greater complexity, beauty, awareness, and possibility. Great. Um, I know we only have a couple minutes. I'd like to make sure that Sarah can uh, can join the discussion and then Bill Velchup also. And for those who have a little bit of time to stay on, I think, David, are you available to continue the discussion for a bit further? Sure, be happy to. Okay, so we'll go at least maybe 10 to 15 minutes beyond noon, um, and then we can wrap up and figure out how to continue the dialogue. But Sarah, please. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Erica. And, and David, it's such an honor to, to meet you and to hear from you. Um, just uh, two quick thoughts. The first is actually building off of Manish. I think um, one thing that is not discussed and uh, I think implied, of course, in David's talk is the um, question of ownership, which really the, the theory of the firm underlies around stakeholder and share versus shareholder theory. And so I think that while it's true we are all part of communities, um, the individual unit of analysis, as it's implied within the theory of the firm, relies on the idea that the ownership of the firm is amongst those that have shares, where the theory of the community is around stewardship and stakeholder theory. And so I think that's a fundamental question, the question of ownership that has to be aborted when you're talking about trying to embed the individual and community. It's that larger question of privatization, privilege, and ownership. So that was my first response to Manish. And my second question was to David around um, artificial intelligence and the mechanization mm -hmm. of society, which feels to me, as a farm girl from New Jersey, uh, you know, really running against so much of what we're trying to do in terms of um, bringing our consciousness into more integrated views of, you know, interdependence on planet. Um, and here we have the rise of AI replacing 40% of jobs in the next, you know, five, seven years. Um, I just love your thoughts on how we build this theory of community into these sort of competing forces, which feel very Cartesian. You know, it's the separation of, of kind of, you know, man and nature. Um, and if you could just help us understand your thinking around that. Yeah, these are excellent questions. Um, the, the, the ownership is foundational and, uh, you know, at the, at the very first level, um, you, you know, the greater equality in terms of ownership is much more important than equality of, uh, of income because it's, it's the ultimate power. Uh, and particularly critical at our current time is the extent to which actually the, you know, the, the finance capitalism, the, processes of making money out of nothing, which then gives a per particular group of people capacity to buy up all of the real resources, the land and the water resources on which we're fundamentally dependent, um, 
it's all part of that concentration of power. Um, now, so the, at the first level, uh, we have to have significant equality. Uh, I sometimes, you know, I just make the kind of facetious comment. Uh, I think private ownership is a very good thing. Uh, it's such a good thing that everybody ought to have some, and essentially they ought to own the means of producing their own livelihood. Uh, now, as, as you're clearly suggesting, uh, as, as we get deeper into it, it goes way beyond the uh, simplistic frameworks of private ownership. It has, you know, community ownership, uh, cooperatives, and so forth, but not necessarily in the sense of classical socialism. Uh, both capitalism and socialism, in a sense, are uh, are are very hierarchical structures. It's just a question of whether the control will be in uh, uh, hierarchical corporations or hierarchical governments. Um, and then we get into the whole issue of the rights of nature, uh, which as you get into that, it totally upsets our, our issues of uh, private ownership. Um, and we have just barely begun to work through the implications of those. Uh, so it's all part of the challenge we need to face. Uh, artificial intelligence, uh, very glad you brought that up. I don't have simple answers, but you know, I'm struck that some of the uh, technophiles uh, seem to celebrate the idea that we can actually get rid of humans. Uh, you know, we just have machines run everything. Well, to what purpose? <laughs> Uh, what, what is what is the concept of creation of life of of being that that framework serves? At the same time, I think we all recognize that there are ways that artificial intelligence can be used to make life more meaningful and creative and so forth, but not entirely to get rid of work because work is part of our source of of being of satisfaction that's part of being human it's part of being creative uh, and we've hardly even begun to ask the right questions let alone find the right solutions uh, but uh, as you suggest the artificial intelligence is one area where uh, we need to do some very creative thinking about how can we use it in a way that is truly beneficial to all people and what are the challenges of, of managing it so that decisions are made based on what will work best for the well-being of all people and, and Earth uh, versus what will most make the biggest profit for the, the smallest number of people. Great. Thank you. I know, again, we're, we're at noon already, Eastern Standard Time. Thank you all for joining. Just a, a quick note that necessary conversations happen regularly. We have one definitely coming up in April with Sandra Waddock and Jim Walsh on uh, perspectives of uh, other intellectual shamans. I would put David Corden and Michael Pearson in that category as well, um, but we have more coming up um, as well as a to be determined in March. Uh, again, before folks drop off, I wanna make sure that we have a chance for Bill to pose his question or comment. Bill Veltrop, are you still on? And if you are, it's okay. on mute on left. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Hi. Erica. Uh, this is really a beautiful coming together. Uh, and I congratulate you, David, on <laughs> your life work and uh, the framing. I've gone through, I've read what you've written several times and am in, aligned with uh, essentially all of it. Um, I have lived in the belly of the beast of the corporation and have worked with corporations for, oh, uh, about 60 years and believe that we are at a, an evolu evolutionary juncture where we need to begin to see our human systems as living systems, just as we see the earth as living systems and recognize that all of the existing systems are perfectly designed to get the results they get. And so 
our systems are designed to be efficient. They are not designed to get conscious. They are not designed to care. They're not designed to self-evolve. So that's what I've been working on is the how. And, and, and it's in the self-interest of every one of these systems to make this evolutionary leap, to go through this metamorphosis from what I consider, I see the empire era as our period of adolescence. We're very young as a species. So the behavior is somewhere between toddler and adolescence. It'd be at, totally adolescence if we weren't following our own nest, dirtying our diapers. But it is, absolutely possible and there are examples of movement in this direction for systems to learn to become conscious caring and self-evolving the ones that do will be sustainable and will help sustain and will thrive the ones that don't will die off and it's not just corporations or not just government it is every traditional organization is trapped in an empire era DNA. And it's no fun for anybody. Really. And so what I've been working on is the how. And it's it's a matter of designing for it. And that's our that's our challenge now. Not to not to debate and argue about how to live or <laughs> ameliorate the agony and the suffering that's implicit in these poor designs but to change the flipping designs. And I think we need to be city-centric to do that. And that it, we need to begin to think of the organ, resident organizations in the city as citizens of the city. We absolutely need to get to the point where all of our organisms have decision-making distributed throughout them. We absolutely need to develop we need to reinvent development big time. And development needs always to be based upon socio-ecological systems. We need to come from wholeness to the parts. We've had enough play with the other direction. So anyway, this is just to plant. Thing to provide the how to the brilliantly described what that David has brought forward. I have Thank you. That's uh, appreciate the compliment and I, uh, we should be in closer touch. Um, I would, one thing that I did pick up from, from the comment is I think by the structure of our institutions, um, the the transformation is not going to come within the existing institutions that they're also structured in a way that almost i mean there may be a way around it but they're very resistant to transformation from within uh so i don't think i would put it in terms of every institution has a self or every system has uh, a self-interest in transformation. Uh, I tend to put it more in terms of every person does. Uh, our primary organization needs to be outside of the existing institutions. So what we're doing right now may, may be an example. I mean, many of you are, you know, hold influential positions within universities, uh, but we're not organizing as a university. We're organizing as a group of people with a sense of common interest and uh, an interest in deep system transformation. And so we're trying to figure out how can we as individuals outside of these institutions self-organize in a way that uh, allows us to transform the institutions. Um, the other, I th I'm very interested in your comment about the city. Uh, I would just add to it that a city itself cannot survive alone without its rural areas. Mm -hmm. And I think this is very foundational to the, pro the political problem we have in the United States now, 
uh, you know, we talk about cities as though they're disconnected from rural areas and the rural people feel uh, isolated and forgotten. Uh, and yet, you know, if we organize around bioregions, uh, the, the city is the kind of the central hub, but the, the bio system includes the rural areas of the rural people and finding their respective roles and relations to each other. Great. Um, so again, uh, with a, I'm going to close us down in about five minutes, but thank you to all for joining and we do have time for some additional questions and discussions. Um, again, I just want to make sure everyone knows uh, if you're intrigued by some of these types of ideas, this type of conversation, uh, please check out uh, other initiatives of Humanistic Management Association. Uh, we've got a great uh, website now with calendars of events and initiatives coming up, including faculty development workshops, uh, a pre-conference at the Academy of Management. We hosted a, a really incredible um, uh, international humanistic management conference in Seattle. This is actually where we got to know, or I got to know David, um, and that's how we've now connected the conversation back to, uh, to everyone here. So again, thank you. Uh, there's an opportunity to sign up for the newsletter. There's an opportunity to sign up for individual or institutional membership. Um, just lots of really, I think, great momentum that we can take from here. Most importantly, as far as this conversation goes, we should figure out how to continue this conversation. We have everyone's emails. Uh, we've got this chat. So uh, I will endeavor with, with Michael and David to, to uh, work out next steps uh, in terms of, again, how do we continue to co-create co-construct, um, explore, and play with these types of ideas to, to make some of the changes we need to make. So um, at, at this point, with just a few minutes left, I, I invite anyone who would like to, to engage in the conversation to just speak up, unmute and speak up, and um, please. And can I just come in, Erica, quickly? Yes. So yeah, I want to thank you, Erica, and, uh, for hosting, and, and David, thank you for coming on. Uh, I unfortunately have to leave pretty soon, so I leave this up. But um, I also wanted to say that anybody on the call that's interested in these kinds of conversations or other ideas, maybe you can reach out to me or Erica. Uh, maybe we can co-construct something as well. This is meant to be sort of uh, a co-creative effort because we have lots to do. All right, so thanks, everyone. Uh, take care. I also want to thank everyone. This is... This has been one of the most help, uh, hopeful and energizing conversations I've had in a long time. Uh, I, I think we're seeing signs here of what, what could be an extraordinary point of breakthrough. Uh, Erica, just one, one quick comment I'd like to make. I'm Gerard Farias here. Hi. I was just wondering about the role models from the past. Like uh, David mentioned, indigenous communities, uh, who I think, uh, from my reading at least, have represent or are role models for us to think about. So it's not that, are we inventing something new or is there something we can learn from in the past? Just, just, just like to point that out. I, hello, my name is Isabel Rimanosi. I also wanted to share that there in this call, there were several members of a prime working group on the sustainability mindset. And that is a group of academics from 35 countries that are all interested how can we develop a new world view with our students so it is a holistic approach so we not focus only on the mind but also on the being dimensions and anyone who wants to hear more about that send me an email i put into the chat my email you're welcome to join or learn more about what this is Great. the more the merrier thank you and also just in terms of a bridging opportunity uh, the Humanistic Management Group also is a working group, a uh, recent addition to UN, the UN Prime Initiative. So we welcome any opportunities um, together to, to bridge. Any other well, questions or comments for David? Hi, this is Catherine Goldman Schuyler. And I am hoping that we will be convening a session at the AOM that will let people meet in person with David, with Michael, and with Sandra Waddock and Otto Sharmer, and it's sort of like an amazing cast of characters talking about writing books that inspire and that inspire people to do the things related to these kind of projects that make a difference so that people don't get caught up 
in the academic loops that so many people think they need to follow. So I'm just hoping that we'll get to do our session and that we'll meet many people and that we won't even find out, but that at least 10 people will come out of that doing something different than they went in. <laughs> Great, thank you. Will Other you questions or comments for David? Oh. Will you be sharing emails? Um, uh, hmm. I'm not, I'm not sure what the protocol on that is. We had about 200 people sign up for this talk. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think if you'd like your email shared, uh, perhaps you can post it in the chat right now. We'll capture the chat. Yeah. One thing that always scares me about that is some people add everybody's name to their list and the email box gets totally overwhelmed. So. Right. I, I think one thing that we can offer is that if you sign up or if you get your permission to sign you up for the newsletter and you have something to share, you can be in touch with us so that we can share it. And that way you can put your email there for being contacted for further conversation. Yeah, that's that may actually be the most reliable. Um, but we will send a follow up email out to all invited um, participants and we'll have some of that information in, in there as well. Right, and I think if somebody says they don't want their email shared, that may be easier, right? That was mentioned. So, great. Thanks, okay. everyone. Um, so again, it's twelve fifteen. I I think we should probably uh, honor the the hour that we set out. Um, thank you all so much. What a rich conversation! It, that chat box itself, mm -hmm. and we barely even scratched the surface. Uh, there is so much more thinking and work to be done. And Michael, thank you. David, thank you so much. Is there um, any way we can access the chat? this, this uh, co-creation and co-construction process with you. Is there any way I, that we can view the chat box after the session? Yes, yes, we'll save the chat. We'll save the chat box. Okay, and send me a link to it so I can look at it. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you all. We'll close the call at this time and we'll follow up. Um, please, let's continue this. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.